Patch, you ready? I'm on. Good evening. Good evening. We'll wait for Charity to sit down. Not that we'd be pointing her out, but that we're waiting. I always feel like I'm up on the stage when I get up here. I know it's a little warm in here, but you know what? It's hot outside. Right. I'll live with warm. The, the uh, title of the service this evening is The Bible is Powerful. I'm going to start out with uh, Let's Go. These are two very simple words. In March 2003, President George Bush is reported to have authorized a massive attack on Saddam Hussein with these two words. What is it about these words that generated enough power to bring a dictator down and send him into a hole in the ground? It was not the words, but who spoke those two words? They were spoken by the most powerful man on earth, the President of the United States, the Commander-in-Chief of the American Armed Forces. The President spoke these words. The President gave the order, things happen. People don't stand around wondering if he meant what he had said. When the president speaks, people do what the president says for them to do. I want you to, I'm going to give you a definition for the word power. Power is the ability to affect change or to produce the desired effect. The word of God has all the power of God behind it. I want you to think about that for a second. When you open up your Bible... You are reading what God has spoken to us. And everything that he says in there is the power of him when he's behind those words. The word of God can transform any situation or person. Because built into the ability to do whatever God desires for it to accomplish. Isaiah 55, 11 says, So shall my words be that go forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the things which I have sent it. When God's word goes forth, the gold of what his word was sent out to achieve will always be accomplished. The unstoppable power of God's word is another attribute that sets God apart from everyone else. Isaiah 14, 27 says, For the Lord of hosts has purposed, and, he, and who will annul him, annul it? His hand is stretched out, and who will turn it back? I'm going to give you a little history here, a little information that most guys seem to know, but not all women do. The average man speaks 10,000 words a day. But the average woman speaks 25,000 words words a day. And any of us who are married know that that's a true statement. Most of the time, we boast, we talk about different things that we're going to accomplish. Sometimes we even make promises. Most of the time we should keep them, but we don't always. But a lot of what we say really never comes to pass. And a lot of times we can be thankful for what we have said doesn't come to pass. Be honest about it. Our plans are frustrated because we are not all powerful. Some people talk to try to show everyone that they are in charge, but their attempts to throw their weight around have no real purpose, just to letting out some hot air. God's word is not like this. God's word has no shortcomings. God's word cannot be frustrated or stopped. God's word never goes around God never goes around showing off his power just because he can. Think about that. Now look at me for a minute. Think about it. God could say something and it has to happen, but it's not God's nature to say I'm going to show off to try to impress anybody. Because he doesn't have to because if you know who God is, you're already impressed. Okay? God's word is always Per, purposeful when he sends it out. In other words, he doesn't just speak to hear himself talk. There's always a reason behind what God has to say. God's power is never random or out of control. 
And God always has a plan that he will fulfill. In other words, so when you're reading your Bible or you're reading, opening up the Word of God and it says something, you can take it as gospel because it is. It is gospel. But it's also, too, of some people read it and they act like it's just, well, okay, that was for them and this is for, yeah, I'm not going to worry about it. No, what the Word is is if you hold the Word of God in your hand, it has no choice, but it has to happen. When we, okay, we're going to look at a couple of examples of, from the Bible. The power of God's Word has accomplished. They show that God, the Bible's external and internal power that will refer to creation that is all around us and the soul and spirit of the innermost recesses of our, th of our beings. The word of God, the word that God spoke as revealed and preserved in the Bible can bring a word into being and cut the, to the cores of our hearts. Folks, do me a favor. Look at me and smile. Just smile. I know we're on tape. But you're all looking at me, and it's kind of like that. Everybody, it's very, for those of you who is going to be on the tape that it's not here, it's been very, very hot today in town. And everybody is tired, and kind of like the heat's drained us. And, you know, when I was reading this earlier today and going over it, you know, it made me think about God's Word is so powerful, but we take it sometimes for granted. If we really looked at it and decided what God can do, we would be in awe all the time. And I'm going to read some of the uh, different attributes and things about God's Word in the Bible and talks about how much power is inside of it. It says, God's Word has the power to create a universe. Okay? Psalms 33, 6 says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He didn't go out and get a two-by-four and a skill saw and start in. He said it, and it had to happen. It created. He, took, he created the universe from nothing. Okay? Psalms 33, 9 says, For he spoke, and it was done. His commands, and it stood fast, referring to the earth and all the mighty oceans. Okay? God can make something out of nothing. To simply speak a world into existence is power beyond anything that our simple minds can imagine. The old theology, theo, uh, I know what the word is. Theo, theo, theologians, good heavens, I'm having a tough time tonight. Theologians have a phrase for, crea for creative act of God when he made the universe out of nothing. It is called ex ni -i -lo, or out of nothing. God did not need any raw materials to work with when he created the universe. God created the raw materials and everything else with his word. God, when God spoke, it happened. In Genesis 1, it records again and again, God said, and it happened. Verse 3, then God said, let there be light. And there was light. Then God said, let the waters under the heavens and get, be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. In verse 11, then God said, let the earth bring forth grass and herbs and yield seeds and the fruit trees and yield fruit according to of its kind whose seeds is in itself of the earth. And so it was. Verse 24 says, Then God said, Let the earth bring forth beasts of the earth, each according to its kind, and it was so. These verses could also be, be, create, be translated, be. In other words, God could have said, Be light, be dry land, be plant life, be animals. Time after time, God said the word and whatever he commanded came into being. There was, no, there was not any gaps or lapse of time. God simply worked out his will with, through his word. Have you ever really thought about when God created the earth? Speaking it into being. It still, it, it amazes me. Because, I mean, if, if you, know, you take materials and you try to build something, and any guy that's a builder understands 
that if you don't do it right, it kind of has one of them lean-tos, you know? And then even if you do get it right, sometimes it's not as sturdy as you want it to be or your wife should expect it to be. Come on, guys, you can at least smile a little bit. Smile, Keith, it can't be that bad. But God said, let it be, and it had to happen. God could create life out of death. Romans 4, 8, 17 says, God, who gave life to the dead and called those things which, they were as, which do not exist as though they did. The Apostle Paul is talking about Abraham's faith in God's promise to give him a child, even though he and Sarah were way too old to have children. In fact, the Bible says that in terms of their ability to bear children, both Sarah and Abraham were as good as dead. In other words, the parts of them that made it weren't working. It was done. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I know sometimes grandparents are glad that they can send the grandchildren home. Okay? But can you think about having a new baby? No. <laughs> She's like, no, uh-uh. It would be a miracle. Same thing on my fi family. It would be also. In verse 4, uh, Romans 4.19, it says, And not being weak in faith, but he can, did not consider his own body already dead, since he was over 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. In other words, they were 100 years old. It's a miraculous thing to have a child, we think about now, into their 40s and 50s, if we had it then. But this woman was 100 years old. She was old enough to be a lot of, our, a lot of, our, a lot of us in here's grandparents, or great-grandma, great-grandparents, really. I'm 52, so if my mom would be in her, could be in her 80s, which means grandma, great-grandma could be in her hundreds, early hundreds. That's old. But it's also thinking about the physical part of it is a miraculous thing that's going to happen. But this was no problem for God. Genesis 18.10 says, And he said, I, God, will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now, this is not going to be something that Abraham's going to just think about that way. Because you know as well as I do, we would have had to have gone, I'm old. This can't happen. This was God's promise to Abraham, and it came to pass. The power of God's word was on display in an even greater way in the birth of Jesus. Luke 1, 26-38 is an incredible passage of scriptures that tells of the angel Gabriel announcing to Mary that she was going to have a baby. We learn in these verses that Mary, though she, she was having a baby, well, excuse me, Mary thought that she having a baby was impossible because she was a virgin. Gabriel informed Mary that the child was conceived by the Holy Spirit and the child would be a, mirac be a miraculous one. Gabriel also informed Mary that God was working with her cousin Elizabeth, who was already six months into her own pregnancy, even though Elizabeth and her husband, Zacharias, had never been able to have children, and Elizabeth was too old to have a child. Many times, Mary had, excuse me, Mary had, I don't know what's wrong, folks. I'm sorry, but I'm just going to keep going. Mary hardly had time to absorb the starting news that she was going to have a baby when which would be the savior of the world, when she learned that Elizabeth was going to have a baby too. We have two godly miracles here. Luke 1, 37 says, for, which, for with God nothing is impossible. Now the word nothing here is actually translated into three words in the Greek text, which literally means not any word. The idea is that no word that God speaks is too hard for him to fulfill. So the fact that Mary was a virgin and Elizabeth was too old was no obstacle for God. Luke one thirty seven says, For with God, not any word will be impossible. So anything he speaks, 
no matter how, and I, I don't like the word outlandish, but so far out that you and I could understand is more than we could ever grasp. But he could make it happen. The power of the God is so miraculous that I, I, I have difficulty sometimes even grasping it, even to understand it all. Because when you read about it in the Word, it seems like, okay, that's just words printed on a page. But I hate to tell you this, folks, if we would really look at it and think about it and understand what the power is that's behind it, it would be a miraculous thing. We talked earlier about God's exercising his power. It is always purposeful. The angel Gabriel explains God's purpose in giving Mary a son. Luke 31 through 33 says, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and he sh shall be called, you sh call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will be no end. What a promise that is to us. The angel Gabriel pointed out that God was working out a plan. God needed a virgin because no human father could be involved. Mary thought she was in an impossible situation, but with God, nothing is impossible. Mary believed the word of God that the angel Gabriel had brought to her. Do you believe the word of God? Do you truly believe it? Do you truly read something into it and take it, or do you say, ah, that's not for me? I mean, it's miraculous to me. In Luke 138, then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be according to your word. And the angel departed from her. She turned it over to God and said, God, I know you can do it. I'm going to give it myself to you and allow you to do it. Do you have situations arise inside of your life which seem miraculous, that there's no possible way that could happen? But you know that God has instructed you to do that? And what you should say is, is God, basically let me get out of your way and let you take over. Because your word says it's going to happen. And I know you can accomplish anything and everything that you want it to happen. So don't be thinking that, oh, there's no possible way that I could be doing whatever it is. Whatever kind of goal God has given you to set inside of your heart. People seem to not want to dream or act upon what the dreams are God has given them. Open yourself up. And don't, allow, don't worry about what the world is going to think about you when you do it. Because if God has instructed you to do it, you will accomplish what you are supposed to. God can make something where, there, where you see nothing. God doesn't need anything to do his work because he is all-powerful. The enemy can try anything he wants, and it will seem that it is working. But God already knew that it was going to happen. And God guarantees that even these things, which we don't know, don't know or don't understand how it's going to happen, but it will work into his divine plan. No matter how long it takes or what is to happen when we get there, God will accomplish his objectives. God's word is sure and effective. God's word sustains what he creates. God not only brought the universe into existence by the power of his word, but the same word also sustains his creations. Hebrews 1.3 says, Who being the brightness of, the, his, of his glory and expressed image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. You can't lose your salvation or be snatched away from God because God's creation, you're God's creation. God keeps you. You don't have it. You turn yourself over to him. He is the one that did your salvation, not you. You can't lose what you didn't create, but God created it so he can hold it in his hands. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. John 10, 28 through 30 says, And I gave them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given me, them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. So, excuse me, 
I and my Father are one. So if God is creating you, and he is holding you in his hand, who's going to take him out of your hand? There's nobody. If he spoke the world into being, the same power that was used to create that says that he will hold you in his hand. So he has made you a promise to always be there with you. And he is going to hold you in his hand and give you the safety that you need to hold. The world looks at it and thinks, oh, no, that can't happen because there's going to be something else going on or somebody else can do this. Nobody can do anything to take you out of God's hand. Only God can control what happens. Because I and the Father are one. Jesus and God are the same. God's word has the power to search us. God's word has the power to pierce into the deepest recesses of our being. Hebrews 4, 12 through 13 says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even into the division of the spirit, the soul and the spirit, of the joint and the marrow, into the desertion of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creation, creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him who, to whom we must be, give account. Have you ever thought about it? God knows everything there is to know about you. You're good, you're bad, when you're happy, when you're sad, when you're wrong, when you're right, when you act like a great person, when you're a jerk, when we have a case of the stupids. Has anybody else in here ever had those? And any of you who hadn't raised your hand are lying, because we all have. But God knows everything there is to know about you, good and bad. Have you ever read the Bible and felt that it's looking into the deepest recessions of your mind? It's like he knows what you're thinking before you're thinking it. And that word right there, it reads it and it comes back to you. And it's like, how could he do that? He's God. God. And then what's co cool, too, is, is you can read a verse one day, and then you read it the next day, and it completely changes before your eyes because what you're dealing with on the inside is what that verse is speaking to at that time. He knows, and he can cut into the deepest parts of you, the parts that you don't want anybody else to be able to get into. He can get there, and he can go into it deep through his word. The Bible reads into us because the Bible is alive and powerful, not dead words on a page. The Bible is a living document because God breathed life into the words of the Bible. No other book can reach down into a person so deeply and bring about the effects that the Bible can. We are not to read the Bible as a novel, a history book, or any other book. We are to read the Bible to get directions for our life from it and allow it to penetrate into our heart. When you read that word, take it into your being. Take it into the most ultimate part of you and realize that God is wanting to speak to you through his word. And take those words and apply them to your life. God wants his word to do spiritual surgery on us. God wants us to lay our souls bare so that he can show us what the answers are and get on the inside of us and deal with the situations that's going on. No one but God can understand the human heart. Have you ever said that before? Nobody understands me. I, I think I, I got somebody right here in front. She's smiling back at me going, yep. But you know what, God... Guys, God can talk to you every time, and he knows just the right words to say, and he sometimes knows that saying nothing is sometimes the best thing at all. But the great part about it is God always wants to listen to us, even though we're doing our stupid ranting and raving and thinking we've got to do this or scream at this or they're not doing that or whatever's going on. He still has the word to console us in every misery that we could possibly have. God knows our deepest thoughts because our souls and spirits are completely exposed to him. 
Every part of you he has already seen. He was with you in every situation that you had, everything you ever did, every situation you were in. Even before you were saved, he knew about it. And there's nothing you can hide about it and try to cover it up. So why are you lying to him about it? Why are you not dealing with the situation that has been in your past? It's already there. He's already got the answers for it. And he's not, you're not going to do anything that's going to embarrass him, or you're not going to be able to do anything that he doesn't already know about. So why not go into his word and grasp those areas that we need to have fixed? And the last is experience the power of God. God's purpose is is that his word goes into our deepest parts and bring and bring begin to remake us on the out from the inside out conforming us in the image of God he wants us to take that word apply it to our lives and start from the inside changing us from the inside of who we are I don't know about the rest of you I don't feel any different on the outside but it comes from the inside because your mind controls what you think. Because you need to take those thoughts captive. Romans 8.29 says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might bring the firstborn among many brethren. You're the firstborn among many brethren. Your job is to reproduce yourself. In other words, instruct others through God's word of how you became got yourself healed. The words that were spoken to you that helped you out are the words you may need to hear, someone else may need to hear. And each one of us in here has a different life and history and things that have come about of different lives. I never was much of one to go out and run around and go crazy, and I never was really a big drinker or a druggie or anything else. I've always been pretty much raised inside a church my entire life. But I think sometimes that's even... Is difficult or more difficult because to me I've always been safe and for people that were way out there in the la la land or whatever it was and were heavy into drugs and alcohol and doing whatever you were doing you think there was at one point you never thought there, you probably thought there was no way God could ever love me I could never be clean enough to be with God I've ruined my life I, I've, I've, I've wasted it away I, I blew away my chances I know that God loves people, but he could never love me. He could never get this, he could never clean this up. But what we don't realize is, is that God's been standing around waiting for you to be, quit being your stupid and to turn yourself back over to him so that he can start on that inside and cleaning you out and removing those areas inside of your life that, that you have been hidden from years because you've been afraid to deal with them. You've been afraid... To, that people may know that you did this or you did that. Well, I got news for you folks. People probably already do know. But you know what? The first person you got to forgive is yourself. And when you do that, you turn yourself away and you realize that God has accepted you just how you are with every blemish you got and every part of you that nobody could ever have loved before, God loved you more than you could ever imagine. And at that time, what he wanted to do is, is he said, come here, child, let me clean you up. And it wasn't some little soap and water that would clean the outside so you would pre be presentable to others. What it was is, is God said, I'm going to purify your heart. I'm going to make you as clean as the day you were born. And we're going to start all over. And it doesn't make any difference what everybody else thinks because it's what you and I think. And when you and I get it right, everything else will come around. Because you'll realize that the power of my word that I take and give to you will cleanse you from the inside out. And the person you used to think you would be are no longer. Because I have accepted you exactly how you are. And you will be made perfect. In my eyes, and as I see you, and I'm talking as Christ... If I see you, you are perfect inside of my sight. And I'm the only one that matters. I don't care what you, you shouldn't care what your neighbors think. You shouldn't care what the people you used to run with. You shouldn't think about your family, anybody else. 
It's all about your relationship with God and allowing him to take his word and get on to the inside of you. Go to the most deep, deep, deep part of you, the area you've been hiding from everybody. Everything you've ever, all the parts of you that, that you knew could never be clean, but if I can cover them up just enough, I can deal with them. God says, I want to wipe those areas clean. I want to make you perfect. The power of God's word is discovered, discovered as we... Wow. The power of God's word is discovered as we cooperate with the purposes for which God gave us in his word. The word will always accomplish God's will, which is good and perfect. The word of God is for you, but it's to clean you from the inside out. Romans 12, 2 says, And do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may, be, may provide what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God wants you to take his word, apply it to your life, and clean you from the inside out. Don't be conformed to what the world thinks. We don't care what the world thinks anymore. The world has gotten so messed up, their value system so far out of whack that they don't have a value system anymore. But be transformed. In other words, completely changed. What used to be is no longer, but what will be now is completely different. By the renewing of your mind. In other words, allow the words to take over what your thoughts should be. And only put those words into, into activity. That you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God's already given us the answers. The question is, is are we applying them to our lives or are we just walking by them? The only real question now is whether we're going to stay on the same old miserable place or move into the action that God's word can provide. Take what the word says and use it. He's put it there for us, folks. He wants us to be perfect in his sight. When you accepted Jesus, you were made perfect inside, in his sight, but now we have to work on us because we have difficulties living with ourselves. We put ourselves up there and we think, oh, there's no way that could possibly be. But what we have to realize is, is God's word can change us. So you, we need to apply it to our lives. Let's go ahead and stand up for just a moment. We're going to have a short invitation. I never want to close out without having one. And if you need me to, I'll be happy to pray with you. But I'd like to just open the altars. And I'd like you to think about realizing that the Word of God is there to cleanse you. It's not there to chastise you. It's not there to punish you. It's not there to, to, to hurt you. It's there to give you that freedom from the inside out. But God's a gentleman, and he's not going to force himself upon you. You have to ask for it. You have to want it. And when you open yourself up to him, he will come in, and he will take care of the situations no matter what has happened inside of your life. So we're going to have just a couple moments of prayer. And if you don't feel like coming forward, you can pray in your pew. But talk to God about the situation and what's going on. He's listening. He's wanting to talk to you.
Dear Lord, I just thank you for the service this evening. But I thank you most of all, Lord God, for presenting your word to us to give us that way to clean from the inside out, to be the children of God that we need to be and that we can remove all the stains that we have put upon our lives, Lord God, but that you sent Jesus to die upon the cross, that blood that covers each and every one of us, Lord God. I just thank you for that. I thank you for the love and you care and accepting us just how we are. I ask you to be with us as we go through this day, and thank you for everything you do for us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.